Well, good afternoon, y'all. Um, I'm Ashley Jennings, and I'm presenting my capstone over the validity of iron as a catalyst for cross-coupling reactions. So for a bit of background, a cross-coupling reaction is a reaction that yields a carbon-carbon bonded product through the aid of a catalyst. Uh, there are different types of cross-coupling reactions which differ in their reactants, catalysts, and reaction conditions. So this is a general overview of a cross-coupling reaction. So an organometallic uh, compound reacts with a organic halide through the aid of a catalyst to produce your product. Um, this is an, a specific example of an organometallic cross-coupling reaction uh, called the Suzuki cross-coupling reaction. So the Suzuki cross-coupling reaction is named after um, Akira Suzuki, who was a co-recipient of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reactions um, uh, in organic chemistry. Uh, a general Suzuki reaction couples an organic halide with an organoboron compound, usually through a nickel or palladium catalyst. Uh, this example here shows an aryl halide being coupled to an aryl organoboron uh, to produce a bio product. And this type of reaction has applications in industrial chemistry and in the synthesis of pharmaceuticals and more complex compounds. So all of these cross-coupling reactions have different implications in synthesis of pharmaceuticals, polymers, and natural products. Um, so this is another Suzuki cross-coupling reaction, uh, which is a one-step synthesis of a natural product that is from a tree native to Colombia that has high activity against leukemia. Um, this is a step in the synthesis of beta carotene, which is a pigment found in plants, vegetables, and fruits, including carrots, and is an example of a Nagishi cross-coupling reaction. Um, and this is an example of a still cross-coupling reaction, and it depicts the synthesis of a polymer that is used, is used for charge storage devices, transparent, transparent conductive coatings, and electrochromic devices. So one of the identifying factors of the difference between the cross-coupling reactions are the viable transition metal catalysts. Uh, palladium, nickel, and copper are all common metal catalysts for cross-coupling reactions. Uh, palladium is advantageous to use because it tolerates many functional groups, um, allowing it to be used in many reactions. Uh, it can also have a multiple number of ligands associated with it, which allows it to be suitable, suitable for different reactions. Um, it's also very robust and can use reagents that are easy to prepare and are stable in ambient conditions. Copper catalysts uh, are able to undergo reductive elimination to produce the product and can be incorporated into a substrate and react catalytically with palladium and has good recyclability. Um, nickel is advantageous because it can react with functional groups resulting in selectivity in, com in competitive cross-coupling reactions. Uh, it reacts with a wide range of substrates and is significantly less expensive than palladium. Um, and recently there has been an increase of interest in using iron as a catalyst and that's what I am focusing on. So there are various advantages associated with utilizing iron as a catalyst. Um, the iron pre-catalyst is a salt. It is also non-toxic to the environment. It's commercial, commercially available and relatively inexpensive. The cross-coupling reactions catalyzed by iron have quick reaction times compared to reactions catalyzed by nickel and palladium, and they don't require ligands to react to completion. It's also noted that iron catalysis allows for the activation of otherwise inert substrates and exhibits selective functionalization. So the type of cross-coupling cross reaction that iron is used um, as a catalyst for is the Kumada cross-coupling reaction. Um, the Kumada reaction can couple an organic halide with a organomagnesium compound, such as Grignard reagents. Um, this reaction can be catalyzed by palladium or nickel, and iron was proposed to be used by Kochi et al. in 1975, uh, but this proposition gained less interest than the former two metals until more recently. Um, the iron precursors, as mentioned before, are salts, and it was seen that the precursor had very little impact on the catalytic catalytic component of iron. So uh, the salt most used uh, is the iron ACAC um, complex. 
And the only time that there was a need for a different type of salt was if a sec alkyl Grignard reagent was being used and then they used the iron saline complex. Um, so after testing the effect of on catalytic activity of the iron salts, the reactivity of different nucleophiles was tested. Um, as shown here, an aryl chloride was reacted with an alkyl Grignard, a sec alkyl Grignard, and um, a aromatic Grignard. Um, these nucleophiles were seen to react relatively well. Um, and as mentioned before, the second um, Grignard reagent is a sec alkyl Grignard reagent, and they use the iron saline complex accordingly. And so a relevant example of cross-coupling being used um, to synthesize a natural product is in the first step of the synthesis of montipyridine. So montipyridine is a cytotoxic product that's isolated from stony coral, and it plays a role in the plant catabolism and anabolism. So being able to synthesize montipyridine in two steps instead of only being able to extract it is representative of the more practical application of iron-catalyzed cross-coupling reactions. So alkyl Grignards also proved uh, to react with different aryl electrophiles really well. Um, this table shows the trend of alkyl aryl reactions um, occurring between benzene derivatives with chloride, tosylate, and tr triflate groups. And all these reactions were carried out in THF and NMP as a co-solvent. Along with alkyl Grignards, aryl Grignards were also seen to react with aryl electrophiles with decent yields. Um, these reactions were carried out in THF without NMP. Um, it's also important to note that all the viable substrates are pi electron deficient um, because aryl Grignards, Grignard reagents are decomposed with the formation of bi aryl products um, when in the presence of a transition metal and when aryl halides are present. So the reason that there are considerable yields here is due to the lower oxidizing potential of the heterocyclic chlorides because they are pi electron deficient. So to further the study of iron catalyzed cross-coupling reactions, it would be beneficial to explore the potential of coupling a functionalized Grignard reagent with an aryl electrophile. So the interest in polyfunctionalized Grignards is to open the range of products that can be synthesized, especially aryl and biaryl products that have a range of usages due to their functional group. Um, so this specific reaction where the halide group is iodine um, has been seen to undergo a palladium catalyzed Nagishi reaction with a nucleophile with chlorine instead of bromine. Um, so it may be worthwhile to run this reaction with varying electrophiles such as um, chloride and iodine, um, tosylate and triflate groups and compare the yield and reaction times of this biaryl product. Um, so I would like to take a little time to thank Dr. Velez for her um, support and help with my capstone and throughout my four years at South Southwestern as my advisor, uh, my capstone classmates for their feedback and support on my presentation at the Southwestern Chemistry Department and all the professors for your teachings and your encouragement. And lastly, for all of you for attending my presentation today. Um, so are there any questions? Thank you. Let's see, do we have any questions? Yes, let's see. Dr. Wigan. You're in mute. <laughs> there we go. Okay, you gave some, you listed some very high percent yields for the uh, uh, iron catalyzed, some of the iron catalyzed coupling reactions. What, how do those compare to the percent yields of some of the palladium catalyzed and some of the other uh, some of the other catalysts that are used in those similar types of reactions? 
Um, for the most part, they were pretty similar. Um, they were seen to be higher in some cases. Um, and against nickel catalyzed reactions uh, with the same electrophile and a similar um, reagent. Let's see Dr. Ruji. Thank you. Hi, Thank you. Ashley. It's so nice to see you. Hi, Dr. G. It's so long. It feels, oh, geez. I just, I, I'm enjoying this just because I get to see all you guys before you graduate a little bit, at least on the screen. <laughs> um, so I have some, I have a question kind of, it, it's generally about the Kumada coupling, but it's related to what you're, you're doing, you're interested in. Um, okay. So the Kumada coupling uses magnesium, uh, carbon magnesium bonds, right? Essentially to do the transmetallation part of the reaction. Right. One of the things about the Kumada coupling is it pretty much was like the, one of the first, um, the first uh, transition metal catalyzed cross coupling reactions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not used very often today. Um, and the reason is because it's not, um, it's not, it, it's e it easily reacts with other sorts of functional groups within the context of a molecule. Could you maybe give me um, some thoughts as to why or what type of functional groups you might want to avoid in your proposal um, that would probably be problematic with the, uh, with the Grignard reagents that you're creating? Okay. Um, yeah, so for my proposal, I'll just run back to that screen, I guess. Um, so for my proposal for the functionalized Grignard reagent, um, I specifically had to make sure that I avoided using uh, magnesium bromide because it was seen to be like really reactive. Um, and so it wouldn't have made the functionalized Grignard reagent. Um, so that's why it's magnesium chloride. Um, with the types of functional groups to avoid other than that, uh, I'm not completely sure on. I just know that um, this general scheme will has been seen to work and um, feasibly could like be said to work for the iron catalyzed. Yeah, I would say, you know, this one will probably works just fine. Um, you know, I would, I would be a little bit worried about the nitrile on there. Why would you maybe be worried about a nitrile in the presence of a Grignard? Although I think this one might be okay. Um, a nitrile in the presence of a Grignard. Um, that is a good question. I should know that, yes. Um, I can't tell you exactly right so, now. So typically Grignard reagents can react with nitriles and other types of carbonyls. I don't, if you remember back from organics so long ago. Yes. Right? Um, you know, Grignard reagents react with carbonyl complexes to do addition reactions or mm -hmm. substitution reactions. Um, so there are reactive nucleophiles, which can create problems. Um, any idea why this nitrile and even this ester up here on your, um, your other structure, any idea why those two uh, would be relatively unreactive relative to maybe a, just a normal ester or another um, nitrile? Um, it was the, the unreactivity of a Grignard reagent in this context with an ester was also seen earlier. Uh, in the study, and it could have been um, because it usually does react with esters to create alcohols, but um, it could be to due to the iron catalyst because it doesn't directly attack the the ester. Yeah, it's possible that transmetallation on the iron is faster um, than the a nucleophilic attack on an ester. I'd also say. This ester is particularly stable um, because it's a aromatic ester, right? Mm -hmm. So it has that additional resonance that essentially stabilizes the uh, carbon oxygen double bond, making it less reactive. So I could imagine that if you took this Grignard reagent and the ester without any iron and heated it, you might end up getting addition and forming the alcohol that you talk about. Right. Thinking of alcohols, 
what other functional group do you think would not be very good to have on one of your Grignard reagents? As I told you the answer. I'm sorry. I, I told you, I just told you the answer. In the question? Yes, in the question. Oh, I must not have heard it. So, so you generally don't want alcohols present or, and you oh, don't want- Oh, yes, present. yes. And do you know right. why that is? Why Grignard's react with alcohols? Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't tell you at this time either. <laughs> so they, they, they essentially do acid-base reactions, right? So while Grignard's are also are strong nucleophiles, they're also strong bases. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to avoid any sort of protic uh, molecules, right? right? Protic positions, right? So an OH is going to be a little bit too acidic, and a carboxylic acid is probably is going to be way too acidic. Um, mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is you're just essentially going to do an acid-base reaction, destroy your Grignard before you get a chance to uh, conduct the transmetallation with iron. Right. Some general things to think about. The, the nitro group, I think, is is totally fine. Those are usually fairly inert, and then the um, the nitrile is probably fine as well in this sense. Um, just one other question, your, your Grignard reagent is really electron poor, right? So you have two really strong or fairly strong electron withdrawing groups. I'm not sure if I know the answer to this question, but why would you, why did you choose such electron poor um, groups? Actually, maybe I do, but. For? For the Grignard reagent you have on the slide. Why did I choose electron? Um... Withdrawing electron withdrawing groups, right? So um, I think I talked a little bit about it um, with the aryl aryl coupling. So all of the um, substrates had to be pi electron um, deficient because um, aryl grignards uh, decompose with the formation of bi aryl products, especially when it's in the presence of uh, transition metal salts and aryl halides. And so, um, so having it be super electron withdrawing um, would lower the oxidation potential for that. So it wouldn't decompose the Grignard reagent. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds like a good reason. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You did very well.